Okay, so now for our final lecture, we're going to look at a few more aspects of how the boundary layers are implemented, sorry, the boundary conditions are implemented in this, simu in this simulation. And then we're going to do a comparison of those theoretical expressions for the Nusselt number that I showed you in the lecture to what we get by uh, conducting the simulation. And uh, to start off, uh, I'd like to insert a surface plot. So this is the uh, previous turbulent uh, result. And if you still have a mid-plane, just delete it uh, in, in order to insert the surface plot. We'll have to delete it anyway. So select face one, uh, click OK. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, you'll want to make sure that is a temperature uh, boundary uh, plot, a uh, surface plot with, uh, with 30 contours. And in this case, it's all red. And that's what we expected, right? So uh, when we viewed the, uh, we hide that surface plot and view the original surface plot that we had, uh, where we're showing the surface heat flux, we've got a dynamic surface heat flux, which is necessary to maintain the constant temperature boundary condition. And um, what we're going to do next is we are going to uh, change the way that we simulate the boundary condition. So um, it's, Kind of unlikely, depending on the context, of course, but it's generally unlikely that you're going to have a prescribed temperature. What you might be more likely to know uh, is the heat flux, because, for instance, you know that you're delivering a certain amount of energy into a system, so the heat flux has to be constant throughout that surface. And in fact, you're going to try to resolve the temperature. You're not necessarily going to know the temperature. You're going to know heat flux. Uh, and... Uh, and so we are going to uh, identify, we're going to, sorry, my Zoom is going crazy here. Uh, so, so again, we're just gonna try a different mechanism for uh, implementing a boundary condition here. Um, so let's go to the boundary conditions. And actually we're also gonna refine the mesh a little bit. So select the global math mesh, you want uh, NX to be 60 nodes, click OK, uh, and then let us rerun. And the reason why we're running is so that we can get um, the uh, new average surface heat flux. And we want to look at the average surface heat flux over the whole plate so that we can match it. And SOLIDWORKS allows us to specify the heat transfer coefficient. That's the H, which is normally this dynamic quantity. And we're going to set it to be fixed uh, across the plate. But what we'd like to preserve, so I left that out, we're going to fix that heat transfer coefficient, but we would like there to be a constant amount of heat transfer so that the heat transferred from the, um, from the uh, plate to the fluid throughout the whole course of this flow field is going to be preserved. And, um, and then we're going to, uh, so I won't spoil it now, but we're going to see what that does to uh, our results. Okay, it says it's finished. Oh, I should insert the goal table. Okay, so we've got an average, uh, now that we've got this finer mesh, we have an average global heat flux of 948.21 watts per meter squared. So we wanna take 948.21 watts per meter squared, that's Q, and we wanna divide it by delta T so that we can get H. So delta T is 320 minus uh, 293.15, so we take 948.21 divided by 320 minus 293.15, and I get 35.315 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So that's gonna be our value of H. And if we go into real wall three, you can disable this temperature condition and set a heat flux. So I'm gonna go 35 point, uh, what did I say? 319, 315, 35.315 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Oh, why isn't it letting me type here? And, uh, 
and now we're going to need to change our goals slightly. So let's expand the goals. Average heat flux, um, you can get rid of now. And yes, we want to insert global goal, uh, and we want to insert an average uh, uh, temperature at the boundary. So average or max? We want a max temperature at the boundary, and we can eliminate the heat transfer goal. So temperature, temperature, temperature. Like, OK. And uh, again, we're going to need to go back into that solver. And uh, now the average max temperature has been set to auto, and we'll manually set that to 0 0.01 Kelvin. And with that, we can rerun the simulation. Let's do a new mesh. Good. And we can watch our. Progression of the uh, simulation. And we'll just give it a moment before it finishes. Hopefully, somewhat soon. Almost done. All right, shear stress is good and the fluid temperature is good. Marvelous. So we can close out of this. Uh, let's go back to our results and take a look at those surface plots. So if we plot the heat flux, now we've got a constant heat flux everywhere, right? Because we have a constant. Uh, um, uh, delta T throughout the uh, flow field in terms of the characteristic temperatures. And, uh, and we've specified a constant heat flux coefficient. So the amount of flux through that plate is constant. So that's like if you had, uh, you know, wires heating a metal plate or something, and you were constantly putting in the same amount of temperature, and you had a boundary layer flow, that heat flux would be constant. The temperature should not be constant anymore. So if we hide that sur surface plot and now show the temperature plot, you can see, ah, okay, well now we've got a range of temperatures. So we before we had perfectly flat red everywhere, you know, it was the maximum temperature. Now we've got a, uh, a uh, fluid temperature that is starting off a little bit cooler and it's heating up as it goes along. Um, and so that is uh, precisely what we expect to see. You, you would, uh, we've, we've swapped out a constant temperature surface condition for a constant heat flux surface condition. All right. And um, so with that, I'd like to start exporting. Well, so, okay. So the first thing we're going to export is that temperature data. So we can open XY plot one and click export to Excel. And let's look at the plot data. And all I care about in this case is the temperature data. And the Y values are going to be the same. So I can actually just ignore the Y values and select that uh, edge one. Now, if I go into the Excel sheet, let's insert on either side here. Actually, I can undo that last one. Let's make T Alt K. So this is the temperature in the case where the uh, surface flux is constant. And we're looking at temperature profile at the outlet. Make that guy a subscript. OK. Paste. All right. Now I'd like to insert a chart. This time I think I actually can just select these nicely. And it should auto if you select those three columns. Uh, yes, that is indeed exactly what I wanted to see. So let's call this uh, outlet outlet temperature profiles. 
format the legend. Okay, we don't want that. So we have T and T alt. And then let's just insert our labels. So on the Y axis, we have temperature. Well, let's just call it T, which is units Kelvin, always units. And here we have Y in meters. Good, okay. And then maybe I'll exaggerate the X axis. So let's set it back to uh, 0.2 or so, or even 0.15 to get a better look at that boundary layer. And what I wanted you to recognize is that despite the fact that the temperature profile in the X axis is totally different because we've specified an entirely different boundary layer, uh, boundary condition at the bottom of our domain. So before you had constant temperature, now we've got changing temperature and constant heat flux, but the total amount of heat that we put into that fluid has stayed the same. Moreover, not only has the total amount of heat stayed the same that we've added to the fluid, we also have this scenario, as discussed before, where there's very little interaction between the momentum and fields and the um, uh, thermal fields, and that's because the uh, density is just not changing enough. And so uh, since the flow field is identical and the amount of heat that we're putting in is, this, is the same, even though the temperature as a function of X has changed quite a bit, at this point where we've added the same amount of heat, the temperature profiles in Y are the same. So we have the same boundary layer at the end, even though the development of that boundary layer is going to be distinct. So that is that is an interesting thing to note. Um, and it, it's, a uh, yes, okay. Uh, the next thing I'd like to do with you guys is to calculate the Nusselt numbers. So like I said, we're going to look at those Nusselt number correlations that we saw in the theory lecture, and we're going to compare those to what the simulation suggests based on the definition of a Nusselt number. So let's just call this data one. Uh, let's call that data, and then let's call another one uh, Nusselt or something. And basically what I want to do is uh, copy everything over and pare it down a little bit. So we can get rid of all of that. So you can get rid of T alt, one minus theta, the U profile. You just want to make sure you keep in, oops, sorry. <laughs> you only want to keep the X and heat flux actually. Okay, and we're going to want to add in some flow properties as well. And so the flow properties, let's just unmerge these and then we will, yeah, actually, I guess it doesn't matter, but this is laminar flow, merge and center. This is turbulent flow. And here we have flow properties. And we're going to pick out a couple key flow properties. So one is the thermal conductivity, which has watts per meter squared, sorry, for per meter Kelvin. Uh, one will be uh, the dynamic viscosity. You know what, I'll just write them out instead of Googling symbols. Thermal conductivity. Uh, kinematic viscosity, we could do dynamic viscosity and density, but it's easier to do kinematic viscosity. That's uh, meter squared per second. Next we have um, um, the uh, free stream velocity in meters per second. 
And then we have the parental number of air, uh, which is unitless. So let's make those all aligned. And so for thermal conductivity, we're going to use a value of 0 0.02. For kinematic viscosity, same as last time, we're going to use 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. So two decimals. For the free stream velocity, we had 15.24 meters per second. And for the Prandtl number, we're going to do 0 0.7 which is parental number for air. Um, and actually, one thing I should just draw your attention to before we move on is uh, in the last lecture, I remarked on how similar the momentum and boundary layers were because the parental number is almost one. Uh, but what I could have said to be more specific is that the thermal boundary layer is a little bit smaller than the momentum boundary layer. Um, so what I, what I could have noted in the previous lecture is that the thermal boundary layer is thicker than the momentum boundary layer. And this uh, y-axis was really a mistake. What this should be is uh, you know, one minus theta and u over u infinity. We're not dividing by maximum value of delta. Um, but in any case, uh, well, anyway, the point is that the thermal boundary layer is thicker because we've got a parental number that's slightly lower than one, right? So thicker in the y direction. And then you expect that as you increase parental number, you know, that that ratio is going to go from thermal boundary being thicker to thermal boundary being thinner. Um, but now let's um, let's compute our uh, our Nusselt numbers. So let me just set that to be a superscript. And the first thing we're going to want to calculate is the uh, Nusselt number suggested by the simulation. So let's say Nusselt number is a function of x. And for the Nusselt number, we're going to have, uh, well, so to calculate the Nusselt number, actually, I should say, we're going to need to insert uh, also we have to calculate H, which has units of watts per meter squared Kelvin. So we need the heat transfer coefficient in order to get um, in order to get the Nusselt number. So there we've got our heat transfer coefficient. Well, we'll have Nusselt number as a function of X, and this is going to be Nusselt number as a function of X simulated. And then we will have a Reynolds number as a function of x. And finally, we will also have Prandtl number. No, Prandtl number we have, sorry. The last thing we'll have is a, a Nusselt number as a function of theory, or let's say empirical. So I'll just finish making my axes here. And all of these guys are dimensionless. There we go. And we can insert a couple columns here. Do the same thing. Okay, so H is going to be uh, the heat flux divided by delta T. So heat flux divided by, and we had delta T being um, uh, 320 minus 293.15. The Nusselt number is gonna be equal to H times X uh, divided by K. So we have K in our little table here. And we can just make that reference constant. 
The Reynolds number, as you will recall, is going to be the free stream velocity multiplied by the position x divided by the kinematic viscosity. And I'm going to do the same thing here where I'm going to fix the values that uh, are constant. And the alternative form of the Reynolds number, or sorry, the Neusselt number, is that we had for laminar flow, the Neusselt number should be equal to 0 0.332 times the Reynolds number to the power of 1 half times the, that just, ah, geez, 0 0.332 times No. Okay. How did I do that? Undo. 0 0.332 times Reynolds to the power of one half times uh, the Prandtl number to the power of one third. Again, Prandtl number is fixed in this case. Uh, all right, and so then we can take all of these values and drag them to the bottom here. And we can do the same thing for turbulent flow with the caveat that, and I'll just uh, make this guy nice, save my progress. The caveat that the Reynolds correlation has changed. Sorry, the Neusselt correlation has changed. So instead of 0.332, we did that it was 0.0296. Uh, multiply by Reynolds to the power of four fifths, and then Prandtl remains one third. Again, we can drag these down. So now let's plot this uh, this uh, data. So let's go insert chart, select our data. And we want to add a series, and let's say a laminar, let's say lam new sim. And I'll give ourselves uh, x, give ourselves y, so it's going to be the simulated value of the new sold number here. And then hit OK. Now let's add lamb sim lamb new imp. Same x values, new y values based on the correlation. And we are going to, oops, cancel, add turb new sim. So make sure you click into the next thing, add our x values, add our y values. Here's our simulated new sold number. And let's add another one, which is turb new imp or empirical, in case that wasn't uh, clear. And for the y values, uh, let us select these. OK. So we can save. And then we can add our elements. So I've added labels to X and Y, legend, title. So this is a new salt correlation comparison, new salt number, new salt number comparisons. And for the y-axis, it's new salt of x in all cases, which is unitless. 
for the x-axis, we have x in meters. These guys are correctly uh, labeled based on how we've entered the data. So we can move this over here. And you'll notice that uh, they do okay. So we have some uh, perturbations at the inlet, uh, not the inlet, I should say, but at the leading edge of the plate. And as we go along the plate, uh, there's definitely some divergence between the um, turbulent and uh, lamp, but it's, they're more pronounced. There's divergences in both cases, but there's a divergence between the long run prediction and the uh, and the uh, simulated Neusselt numbers. And so what you will do in your assignment and, in the, and, and for the participation grade is you want to uh, increase the mesh resolution and do this comparison again. And what should happen is that these numbers should come closer together. Uh, and then the name of the game in CFD of convection is that you would wanna get this simulation to be very precise so that you can really trust the uh, simulated behavior, and then you would report Neusselt number correlations that you can calculate from that simulation. And then as an engineer, you can look up that Neusselt number correlation, and you can use it to calculate H, you can use it to calculate Q, you can use it to calculate, uh, you know, temperature profiles. And so, so the CFD can support a lot of pen and paper engineering work later on, uh, but it can also be used to design components in the context of uh, of your fluid simulation. So that's all for the final lecture. And, um, and for your homework, like I said, you'll be asked to uh, explore those uh, aspects of how the simulation and correlations compare as you refine your mesh.